What is going on everyone? Today's video is going to be focused around fishing for smallmouth bass around the spawn. This is not a spawning smallmouth video. I'm not going to talk about how to catch spawning smallmouth because quite frankly it's pretty easy. But this is kind of fishing those pre-spawners and post-spawners when other fish are already on beds to have really really good success. This is one of the best times of year to catch the biggest fish of your life because you have late pre-spawners in play, you have post-spawners in play that are feeding up, recouping to get back out in deep water. So there's a lot of really, really big fish to be caught without looking at them and catching them off bed. So I'm going to break this down for you guys, dispel the myth that you need to be bed fishing for smallmouth, and to give you some information to hopefully help you guys have a lot of success on the water. So you kind of have to understand the season. Like I mentioned, uh, this is going to be fishing around the spawn. So for me, this is 55 degrees till about 65, 70 degree water temps. This is something I like to do. It's basically shallow stalking these fish, getting up on these shallow flats, kind of looking for dark spots, looking for boulders, looking for rocks, looking for areas that smallmouth are going to be hanging out and kind of ambushing prey. That's really going to be the biggest key as we kind of go through this. But notice that that 55 to 70 degree water temp is where I'm going to be really focused on this technique and this strategy to go catch big smallmouth. Without diving too deep into spawning smallmouth habits, you do have to understand where they're going to spawn to have success with this pattern. So the biggest thing you have to know is smallmouth are going to spawn in moderately shallow water and they actually don't mind hanging out or spawning on the main lake. The biggest thing about spawning smallmouth they're going to spawn around isolated cover. So you're looking for shallow flats, moderately shallow flats relative to your body of water with isolated cover where these fish can kind of get around and protect their beds on the backsides of these rocks, boulders, uh, logs, these uh, backsides of these dark spots, which are basically slight depressions in the bottom. That's where fish are going to be spawning on shallower flats. They live a nomad lifestyle, especially once they move off the bed. So what you're going to be looking for is some deep water access nearby where these fish can kind of spawn, do their thing and quickly move back out to deep water. So that's another big thing you want to look for. And that's why they spawn a little bit closer to the main lake than largemouth do, which get way in the back of the creeks. Another big thing is that bottom composition is super, super critical. You need the right bottom composition for these fish to lay their beds and lay their eggs. So you don't want to be fishing around straight beach sand. A lot of times what you're looking for is a mixture of bottom compositions, whether that's small pebble, that's gravel, that's these little bit bigger boulders. Another really good place is perch grass. These fish can clear out that perch grass pretty easily. And as long as there's a piece of cover for them to spawn on, it's a really, really good area for that fish to make its bed, hang out, and so that's going to be a great place for these fish to get pre-spawn on. So what we're going to be talking about now is the pre-spawn and post-spawn, how they're moving in and out of these areas, and really immediately before they get up on bed is where we're going to be targeting these fish. So you're going to really be targeting the fish moving in and out of these bedding areas. You're going to be looking for these fish that are pushing up on these shallow flats, and I'm talking expansive, expansive, you know, acres and acres of shallow flats that you're going to turn the trolling motor on high and cover water with, but you're going to be looking for these areas where fish can easily move up on and around that has kind of a mixture of all of these right factors. You know, you have isolated cover, you have the right bottom composition, and you have areas where fish can get up and kind of spawn and roam with clear water, light penetration, and a little bit of forage to kind of help them feed up in that last push or the first push off the bed. One of the other things is that a lot of these pre and post spawn fish will actually need that edge the first hard edge, so you're looking for something that has a hard edge to it. These fish don't necessarily want to get caught up on the shallow flat and not be able to get off really quickly, so a lot of times it is related to deep water access. Some of my best spawning areas have a really hard deep water edge, which means that these fish can basically kind of get up on these shallow flats, hang out, spawn, kind of roam around, and then quickly, very quickly move back off into deeper water. The goal of these fish in the pre-spawn is obviously to find a suitable spawning habitat. So a lot of times these fish aren't super interested in baits. Uh, you're going to have to make multiple repeated cast areas into fish, especially when you see them roaming. But their goal really is to look for spawning habitat. So although it is kind of one of the most fun times to catch these fish, super, super visual, especially when you're making long casts to them, it can be really frustrating. So you kind of have to keep that in mind. They're not up there to eat, but if you make the right precise cast and you can make repeated casts to them, a lot of times you can get them to go. And a lot of times those are the bigger fish you're going to be catching are those roaming pre-spawners. Whereas in the post-spawn, their goal is kind of to recoup, to just hang out, to be like zombie-like and eat like mayflies and bugs off the water, which mayfly hatch is going to play in really big in the post-spawn. I'm going to have another video coming on that, but 
most of the time, these fish that are up here on these shallow flats are not up there necessarily crushing bait and feeding, especially in that 55 to 70 degree time frame. So this is something I want to bring to you guys more often. I want to pull in lake maps. and I'm really excited to actually show you guys areas that are associated with the patterns that we're going to be talking about. And in this case, we're going to break down two different areas and really be talking about the, the fishing around the spawn transitional movements of these fish. So if you look at this very first spot, what you're looking at essentially is an area that has all three sort of locations for these bass to be hanging out. So out here in the middle, you have your main pre-spawn slash wintering hole. This is really your first hard break that these fish are going to set up on as they start to move in shallow water, transitioning out of that deep winter time pattern. And then you have your big shallow flat where these fish are going to roam and hang out and end up spawning and then basically roam around again until they move back out into deeper water. So this is a really good area that has all of the things that you look for for basically any condition that you're fishing. It's going to be good all year long. And because you have these really good hard contour lines these fish can move to deep water really quickly if there's a big cold front that pushes through or there's a big system that pushes in that backs these fish back in and out so you have access to deep water access to shallow water and you have good contours and um, different kind of structures in between so as we go to the next slide what i want to really key in on is this point right here we're going to look at this point look at this spawning flat um, and talk about how these fish are going to move up and down this as the seasons kind of transition in and out and how you can fish this area effectively with what we've already talked about in this video so far so if i zoom in on this area a little bit what you're going to see is a close-up of the area that i just showed you guys with the big red arrow pointing to it so you have this 10 foot kind of steep drop right here on the edge of this point. Then you have some inside turns and some little points as well that these fish can stage and set up on. But you have a giant shallow area right here where these fish are going to want to hang out and they're going to spawn and pre-spawn and roam around and get really finicky and tough. But these are some ways that you can effectively fish this area and have a lot of success. So I'm going to pop in some arrows, some red arrows that are going to show us kind of what we're going to be looking at. So obviously you have your main obvious point access to deeper water it's going to be the area that these fish can move up and down really really quickly and this is going to be the main starting point for pre-spawn fish these fish are going to want that access to deep water quickly especially as they're closer to pre-spawn because they're going to want to move in and out very quickly as this kind of transitional phase starts to happen the next spot that we're going to talk at about is this little flatter area. This is going to be a good spot for fish to hang out and sort of funnel into the flat. So as they start to set up on this point, they're going to kind of funnel down this flat and then get onto the shallower break. The benefit of this spot is that there tend to be more areas that these fish can kind of roam around and just linger on. And it's a really good spot to throw a hair jig as it flattens out because you can basically maximize the strike zone here it's also a really good spot to throw a jerk bait especially early season as these fish kind of get onto this flatter area uh, and spread out a little bit because you know they're going to be up here there's good contours for these fish to sit and it's just really going to congregate these fish in this flatter area and then obviously you have the giant flat up here where these fish are going to spawn and hang out and roam and we're going to talk through all three areas as we go through this little demonstration. Now I want to show you guys the Google map version of this because I do think it's really important to get an idea of what it actually looks like with satellite imaging. And you can get a really cool picture of what it looks like basically comparing it to that Garmin mapping that I just showed you guys on the last one. So if you look at it here, you have your hard point and then you have your little secondary point right here that was shown in that last and then your basically shallow or flat area, but you still have access to deeper water off of this flat. So if you really look at it on satellite imaging, it gives you a better picture of what's actually going on here. Um, but you can also see dark spots, you can see sand ripples, and you can see these this little channel that flows in here where these fish can set up and they're going to get on that. Like when they're up in these shallow flats, a half a foot difference is a big deal to these fish. So you have to really pay attention to what's going on up on these shallow flats because every little minute detail makes a big difference when these fish are up here looking to spawn. Now, obviously, like I pointed out, here's that main point that we were talking about in the last slide. Then you have 
a secondary smaller point, the inside turn where the bag flat was. And then finally, here's your giant flat. Uh, and this is where your fish are going to spawn on stage and get ready to spawn. So if you zoom in on the big flat itself, one thing I really want to talk about and I mentioned a lot is looking for these dark spots. One of the benefits of satellite imaging is you can actually see these dark spots and they don't tend to move. Fish will actually set up in these dark spots and they'll stage and hang out, whether it warms up faster, whether the bottom composition is right for those fish, where there's an ambush point for them to ambush bait as it pushes by, or maybe there's more bait there, more life in the, in the dark spots on the bottom. It's a really good place to look for smallmouth. But also as we get up on this flight, you can start to see these um, shallower pieces of cover. And this is a lot of times where fish are going to spawn. So obviously you'll have some that are spawning here in this darker bottom area because that's what the composition looks like a lot of times where they spawn. But you also have some dark bottom area around these shallow pieces of cover. So there's a really good time and place for you guys to be using Google Maps in conjunction with your Garmin mapping. Um, both are going to help you identify areas that fish should be staging. But it's really unique being able to pull up to an area, knowing what it looks like on the on the mapping, and maybe even having some of these spots already marked with your Garmin in conjunction with the Google Earth. But it's just something that you guys can play with, and this gives you an opportunity to visually see what I'm targeting when I'm up on these shallow flats. So what I'll do is I'll basically get up, get my boat up on the shallow flat, and I'll kind of troll around and I'm making long casts with that hair jig or you know the Ned rig or the jerk bait or that little Okashira screw head style bait to these dark spots and I'm going to be visually looking for them with my eyes but also just kind of fan casting around and looking for fish to follow baits but if you know where these spots are at you can really target them and key in on them a lot more quickly and these these spots will be good year after year so having them marked is really really critical. Now the next area that we're going to look at is a really predominant spawning flat um, really really popular uh, in the state of Michigan. If you guys like to catch spawning fish, this is where a lot of guys do it. So I want to start by showing you guys this mapping because you can't really get a good picture of what's going on up here. But as you pull on the Google Earth imaging, it's going to make it a lot more obvious. So if you look in the bottom left-hand corner here, you have the deeper water as it transitions and funnels in with this inside turn here up onto the shallow flat. That's fairly obvious, but the fact is when you click on the satellite imaging, you get a totally different picture of the area. So overlaid, basically, what you have here is your deeper water over here on the left. You can tell by the darker coloring, but you can also see these sand or rock ridges where these fish can stage before they push up to spawn. You also have these hard sand ridges and rock ridges pushing in up into the shallow spawning flat. And these are gonna be really good staging areas, but they're also gonna spawn out here. So it's a really good thing to note that there are these rock ridges for these fish to stage on and to spawn on. You can also start to see some dark bottom areas up on the spawning flat itself. That's gonna hold some fish. That's typically your marl style bottoms, that kind of chunky, silty, mossy, I, I don't really know how to explain it, the marl type bottom with the little shell and silt in it. You can see that up here on the spawning flat, but you can also see some shallower rock ridges up here, as well as isolated boulders as we start to zoom in. So as we take a really close look at the actual spawning flat itself, you're going to get a good idea of where these rock ridges are. And it's really, really nice to be able to visually see these with the satellite imaging. You can physically go in and mark them, transfer them to your graph, and take it out to the water, and that way you'll have the rock ridges marked. But you can also see isolated individual boulders. Now these are where fish are going to spawn, they're going to stage, and this is where satellite imagery is going to be really critical because fish will actually get post-spawn on these big, big boulders really heavily. When, when they get on these big boulders, after they're done spawning, they'll stage there and they'll kind of just wait out for the mayfly hatch. And it's a really good area to kind of key in on, especially if you're up there on those shallow flats. And you can visually see them most of the time from a long ways away, but having them marked makes it really easy. If it's overcast, if it's cloudy, if the water's a little bit dingy, you can still target these fish, these post-spawn and pre-spawners, which is when they're going to be the biggest without visually seeing them. So keep that in mind. Go in here, use your satellite imaging in conjunction with your actual mapping to get the best picture of what's going on. And really for me, the pre-spawn, spawn, and post-spawn is where I'm going to be using satellite imaging um, probably the most, especially in clear bodies of water. You can get a really good picture of everything going on. Uh, my buddy Johnny Schultz at Fish the Moment has probably some of the most comprehensive videos on how to use this tool 
as well as Bradley Hallman, but there's a lot of really cool ways you can use satellite imaging in conjunction with your mapping to make yourself more efficient on the water. But I really want to kind of include these more as we go throughout this series and start to talk about patterns and breaking things down. So if you guys enjoyed it, please go give it a thumbs up. Let me know down in the comment section below if you guys like me using satellite mapping and my Garmin mapping in the videos. And without further ado, let's kind of dive back into the talking segment. So that's kind of the gist on what's going on pre-spawn and post-spawn with these fish, especially if they're on these giant, expansive, shallow flats. But as we get into fish characteristics, they tend to be lone roamers. They don't tend to be big groups of school. You're not typically going to notice, you know, big pods of fish. Once they push on these flats, they tend to be isolated fish that are getting up there looking to go do the thing. They're not up there with their buddies, like hanging out, chilling, pushing bait. Just that one fish that, you know, couple fish that are getting up there, just getting ready to go do their thing. So it's not going to be a day where you're sitting on one spot, hammering the same fish over and over and over and over again, the same spot. You're going to be kind of having to move around, be mobile, cover a lot of water because this is going to be an isolated fish sort of thing. But it can be one of the best times to catch the biggest fish of your life. Those late fish that are moving up to spawn. And then once those fish move off in the post spawn, they're no, they're no chumps either. They're going to bite and they're going to be big fish. So don't think that if you're not catching them on bed and you're catching them post spawn, you're necessarily going to be at a huge disadvantage here. They'll feed up. They'll get fat pretty quick. Um, so kind of just keep that in mind. As I kind of alluded to before, these fish are also going to be really curious but not necessarily super aggressive they're not up there to feed so they'll follow your bait from a long ways away but not necessarily bite it especially with a hair jig that bait has so much drawing power you'll pull fish from a long ways away with that thing this is where repeated casts and being stealthy with your boat and trolling motor are going to be super super critical when you're covering these flats you want to keep that trolling motor on like a moderate speed so you can move water quick but when that fish has come to the boat you don't want to have to you know, run over that fish with your trolling motor moving on 100. So at the same time, well, you want to keep your trolling motor on a moderate speed. I like to keep it on four or five. You don't want to be running over fish as they're following your bait back to the boat. So understand like they're super curious fish, but they're not necessarily aggressive. It might take repeated casts. So be cognizant of that as you're running your boat and covering water. If you see a fish, be willing to chase it down, but not necessarily run it over. Also, super shallow water, they're gonna be spooky. You wanna be quiet in the boat. You don't wanna be making a ton of noise, hooting and hollering, stepping really hard on the deck. That does transmit in the water. You guys gotta think, when you're underwater, sound travels a lot faster, a lot further. Um, fiberglass hulls, aluminum hulls, they make a lot of noise. So be cognizant of that. Understand, like, your boat is making a lot of noise. You're in shallow water, they're already spooky fish. The more noise you make, the less bites you're gonna get throughout a day. For this next little segment here, I wanna break down the three key baits that I like to use in shallow water. They're all on spinning setups. They're all with six to eight pound test, fluorocarbon line on an eight pound braid backing. The big key with the braid is you can make longer casts with that, and the lighter line just gives you a little bit more stealth in that shallow water situation. So we're gonna kind of go to my least favorite or least used to my most favorite. Um, and the first one I wanna to talk to you guys about is just a little swim bait head. This one happens to be in a screw head design which has the prop in front of it, but really just a small swim bait is gonna be a big player for me. The reason for that, uh, you can make targeted casts, you can swim it, it has a natural swimming bait fish style action. So a small swim bait is gonna be a big player. I'm gonna let the depth really decide how big of a swim bait head I'm gonna use, but a lot of times it's an eighth or maybe up to a quarter, depending on if I'm fishing in that eight to 10 foot range. But for the most part, that uh, little swim bait head is gonna be a big player. It's gonna be a little bit heavier than these other two baits, so I can cast it a long ways and cover a lot of water with that. The rod that I'm throwing this on is a TFO 713 tactical rod. It's one of my favorite rods from them, super versatile. It's a 7-1 medium light, three power, um, which is really in between a medium light and a medium, and then a Zeta 30 size spinning reel. Eight pound test braid line, X5 to seven or six pound test fluorocarbon line. The next bait I wanna to talk to you guys about is a Ned rig. This is something I always have rigged up, especially in shallow water. The reason for that is I can make targeted casts with this. The head's a little bit heavier. This is a quarter ounce head. And the reason I like that bigger head is because it can really, really ping point casts. If I want to swim this up in the water column, I can. If I want to drop it straight down on their head, basically by making a long cast of them and drop it to them, I can do that as well. But having a, a quarter ounce head makes allows me to make really long casts, target these fish from a long ways away. 
bait that I'm using on the back there is a little piece of hit worm. I like this a lot. Nathan showed me this last year, but the benefit of this is it has a swimming motion, has a little tail kick on it, um, but it's not super, super aggressive. So slightly more than a standard TRD, not quite as much as some other kicking style baits. So it's kind of that cross in between and you can swim it really nicely just like this hair jig that we're gonna talk about next. The rod again is that TFO Tactical Bass 713. Uh, the reel, the exact same Zeta 30 size spinning reel, eight pound test braid to six pound test floor carbon line. You're gonna notice basically the reel setup is gonna be virtually identical with the exception of this last setup which is going to be my hair jig setup. This here is gonna get the most work for me, especially on these super shallow flats. The benefit of a hair jig is that you can swim it, you can kind of glide it and float it in front of their face. Uh, this one that I've custom tied, I use a Do-It Molds 332nd ounce head. It's probably my favorite overall size in less than eight foot of water. Then I take a little piece of Max Scent Hit Worm on the back. I think that Max Scent really plays a big deal. It just helps those fish track this bait or commit to this bait and it helps me get a little bit more weight on that bait to cast it. Casting the 330 seconds in any wind is not fun. So the rod that I'm pairing it with is a very special TFO rod that I can't talk too much about yet. Should be coming out very shortly, but a great choice for that as well is the TFO Professional Walleye Series rod. It's a 7.6 medium light. So if you're looking for a rod right now for hair jigs, check out that TFO Professional Walleye Rod 7.6 Medium Light. has enough backbone to set the hook into that fish without tearing a hole in its mouth. But we're going to be coming out with something really, really cool very shortly. The reel that I'm using is super important for this. It's a slow speed gear ratio reel. This is a Fluger Purist. I have used this thing, I can't tell you how long. I bought this reel a long time ago. It actually doesn't have much of the writing left on it. The key to this, it's a 5 2 to 1 gear ratio. A lot of times, you know, this used to be an issue about five or six years ago. Spinning reels weren't fast enough. Well, now everyone is way too fast. The Flugers are one of the few reels on the market that I can, they can find that are in that slower gear ratio. I'm using eight pound test braid to a six pound test fluorocarbon leader. There's no compromise on this for me. Using that lighter line allows me to longer cast, especially with a tiny bait. So there's no compromise on this setup. Eight pound test to six pound test fluorocarbon line. Key with the hair jig and I'll make a video on this. Make as long a cast as possible. Just slow steady retrieve. You don't have to really do anything fancy. Don't change your cadence once that fish gets behind that bait because it'll draw them from a long ways. Just keep that bait coming. Keep it reeling and eventually they'll overtake it. They'll bite it. Not really a super aggressive bite. You just set the hook, you lean, you reel them in, you get them to the boat. Very very high landing percentage. Catches fish from a long ways away that other baits can't get these fish to go on. Especially those smallmouth in shallow water. There's just something special about that hair jig. So if you don't have some, you need to get some, especially for fishing around the spawn and the mayfly hatch. And so that was probably one of the most in-depth breakdowns that I've ever done, included some map study, included baits and information. If you guys enjoyed this video, please do me a huge favor, hit the subscribe button, share it with all your friends. Enjoy the time fishing out on the water this time of year. It's one of my favorite times to get out. You get to sight fish and stalk these fish in shallow water without necessarily having to look at them on beds which is what a lot of guys are doing out there. So it's a really, really cool approach to catching these big fish. If you have any questions or comments, hit me up in the comment section down below. As always, thank you for watching. Take care of Tart Lines. God bless. Pursue your passion.